Awesome. Thank you very much for the introduction. It's great to be here today. Looking forward to this session. As mentioned, I will be talking about value, metrics, and how to measure success in your products. I would love to take questions today as well. So if you do have any questions that come up during the talk, feel free to leave them and I will answer them at the end of today's talk. But first, before we get into the session, just a little quick introduction about me. So uh, as you can see, my name is Edward. I'm currently a lead consultant at ThoughtWorks and I work with different clients around their agile and product management practices, helping them upskill and uplift their capabilities internally. I've been working in tech for about 10 years uh, where I started out as a software developer before moving into project management roles and then eventually product management where I've been working uh, for the last five or so years. I'm also super, super lucky. I've had the opportunity to work in a variety of different domains uh, from large investment banks to small digital agencies, uh, different startups across both Australia, China, and the US. Uh, and then outside of all of that, I spend a lot of time in my, my personal time getting into code things and building random products with stuff like generative art, and no code, which I'm also super, super passionate about. But that's a little bit about me. To talk about what we're gonna go into today, what I'll be sharing is a little bit more about how you can answer some of these kinds of questions. Now, these are questions that I hear a lot from clients that I work with at ThoughtWorks, like why aren't our customers engaging with the latest feature that we released? How can we modify the experience to improve our products? And why are our customers losing interest or churning? So to answer these kinds of questions, first we need to kind of understand people's motivations. What pulls people to engage? What pushes them away? And while all of us are unique in our dreams and desires and fears and anxieties, as humans, we have a lot in common. And thanks to modern research, we're actually getting better at understanding what motivates people. And as product managers, we're actually able to apply that knowledge to build better products. So with that in mind, how do we actually apply that? For me, there are four things that product managers should be good at. And as you can see here, they all focus on value. First of all, product managers need to be good at understanding value. They need to be understanding, they need to be able to build value, communicate value, and also measure it. Today, I'm going to be talking about the three in bold here, understanding, communicating, and measuring value. Building value, I'm sure you are all familiar with how to build software and how to build it well. For me, I wanna focus on these other areas which often we don't put as much focus on. So first of all, you'll see that all of these focus on value. So why is value so important? As I mentioned earlier, when we think about value, value is really what motivates people. And value is different from just delivering a feature. Delivering a product or feature is not the same thing as delivering value. And I think a lot of the time we sort of forget that and we end up in this trap where we are constantly just building, 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 and building. A really classic example of when that's happened is Microsoft Word. I want you to think of Microsoft Word, especially in maybe some of the older versions, all of the different functionality that Microsoft Word contains. Think about those menu bars and all the different little buttons that exist. And then think about how many of those buttons you actually use day to day or when you're using Microsoft Word. Another classic example is the TV remote. You may, may be familiar with some of these older TV remotes that ended up with just hundreds of buttons on them. And coming across this kind of thing, it's kind of hard to understand exactly what each of these buttons did. 
and it can be a little bit overwhelming. So are all of these buttons valuable? We're not sure. Maybe, maybe for some of you they are. I know for me, the few buttons that I would use on a remote are much smaller than the ones that you see here. So to understand a little bit better how we can understand value, I wanna talk about what value is. And to break that down, I wanna look at value through the lens of these four principles. When I think about value, I think about value from the perspective of the customer. Value is not from a business perspective. Value is created by a business, created by a producer. And from a customer standpoint, that's why the producer exists. They are really there to provide them value. Now, this is really important, and this is a concept that exists in lean thinking, if you're familiar with lean principles. Value can only be defined by the ultimate customer. And it's only meaningful when expressed in terms of a specific product, whether that's goods or services, that meets a customer's need at a specific time. Another thing to think about when we think of value is that it's finite. It won't run out. That means value can be shared. It can be received multiple times by the same person. It can be duplicated. It can be provided repeatedly. Value doesn't disappear. But in saying that, value is also based on context. So when we think about value and how much value you get or can provide, it does depend on the situation. The value may increase or decrease depending on context. And finally, when we think about value, we must think about it in terms of its comparison to something else. Value must be comparable. We can only really understand value if we compare it to some alternative. To explain this in a little bit more detail, I want you to think about a simple glass of water. When we think about the value of a glass of water, if we're a business, we're not thinking that the value of this glass of water is that it's going to make me money if I sell it to the customer. No, when we think about value, the value of the glass of water is defined by the customer. So what value does that provide the customer? It may help them with hydration, it quenches their thirst. It's not that selling that glass of water makes money. Value is not finite if we think about this in the example of water. I can drink water multiple times and every time I do, it will provide me some value. It will help with my hydration or help quench my thirst a bit. But in saying that, the value of that changes. If I was stuck in the middle of a desert and I hadn't had a glass of water for a really, really long time, that glass of water is going to be a lot more valuable to me than maybe when I'm at home next to my fridge, which has got nice cool water in it all day. And when we think about it, we also need to think about what is the alternative of this glass of water. And oftentimes the alternative is just not having a glass of water at all. So the value for the glass of water is that it can quench my thirst as opposed to not having any glass of water. Or we can compare it to the value of having a glass of milk, which maybe after eating something spicy is a little bit more valuable. So thinking about value, there are those four principles that we should understand. But to get even better at understanding value, I want to introduce you all to this model. Now, the premise of this model is simple. It's that our brain, over time, makes us behave in certain ways. Those key fundamental ways is either to minimize some form of threat or risk, or to maximize some form of reward. That is how our brain processes and creates an indication of value. Our brain interprets the kind of social rewards that we get 
from products that we use every day in a really similar way that our brain focus focuses and processes the need for things like food and water. So through neuroscience, we're actually able to help understand a little bit more about how our brain processes things. And it tells us in a very simple way, threat versus reward. So I want you to think about a scarf. If you think about a scarf and you think about this model, threat and reward. What is the value that a scarf might provide? A scarf may provide us some value by keeping us warm. The value there is that it helps reduce the threat of freezing or being cold. It helps prevent something bad happening to us. And although for those of you who are in Singapore, it doesn't get very cold here, there might be a different value for a scarf. Maybe it's not that it pro produces some value in terms of reducing some risk, but maybe that it actually adds value. Maybe it makes us look cool or it makes us look quite stylish. A scarf, something super simple, we can break it down using this model to help us understand a little bit more. What is the value that it provides? Maybe it helps us reduce the threat of being cold, or maybe it provides us some value reward by making us look very trendy and stylish. This idea and why I talked about scarf just now is because the model that I'm talking about is the scarf model. Now, this is a model that was developed somewhat recently back in 2008 by a guy called David Rock in his uh, paper that was titled SCARF, a brain-based model for collaborating with and influencing others. What SCARF is really talking about is the domains that influence people's behavior. How people are motivated based on these key themes of threat and reward, and what are the different factors that often can impact somebody's motivation in different kinds of social situations. This model can help us when we're thinking about the products we're building by helping us understand the types of value that we may be able to provide our customers. For example, are we helping them improve their sense of status? Maybe by helping them do their job better, so that they can get a promotion at work. Maybe we're helping them reduce the risk of uncertainty in the future by helping them plan with their finances better. Or maybe it's as simple as just helping them connect with other people to make them feel like they belong to some part of a community. This model is super helpful for just breaking down the products that we're building and helping us understand what is the value within these different factors that can really help us understand the motivations of our customers and thus help us better understand what is the value that we're actually providing them. On top of this model, there are some additional factors that I would want everyone to also consider that kind of impact how a customer might think about value. Time is really important because it, this determines when the customer believes they will get a benefit or receive that value. For example, if it's our water, if I buy the cup of water, I will probably get the value immediately. So I drink it and I immediately quench my thirst. Some value will be delivered over a longer period of time. So for example, maybe going to the gym or buying a gym membership doesn't necessarily provide any immediate value, but over the long term, I will get the benefit of being healthier or stronger. So time is an important lens for us to consider when we're considering the value that our customers get from our products as well. 
And not only that, but also the accessibility of that value is really, really important. And when I say accessibility, I really mean how hard is it to then achieve or receive that value? Do they have to pay a huge amount of money? Do they need to put in some physical efforts like exercise? Do they need to have some unique knowledge or skill or do they have to build something themselves? How easy or difficult is it for people to then receive that value? And finally is the perception. What does the customer perceive the value to be? There are two types of perceived value. It could be direct or indirect. Direct is very, very clear to the customer exactly what need this fulfills. Whereas indirect value may be something that the customer doesn't actually know exists when they're seeking out that product or service but does provide them some value indirectly. Again, maybe the example of the gym, maybe the direct perceived value is that I'm going to lose weight, but there is an indirect value of actually feeling like part of a community because I'm going to the gym and making friends there. And I feel like a sense of belonging with the people that I go to the gym with. So there are different forms of value that we can think about also on top of that SCARF model. So if we're able to use these models to understand value, that's one thing, and then build it is another, but we also need to make sure that we're good at communicating that value to our customer. We need to really understand and be able to communicate well when we're selling something or when we're marketing something to our customers that we can back it up with why. Why should the customer use this thing or buy this thing or use this service? We need to be able to convince them that it's something that they want. I really love this image from uh, Sam Hulick. Uh, he is the founder of useronboard.com. And I think this image really helps illustrate that what you're selling to customers is not just the features or the product that you're building. What you're selling to customers and what you're communicating to them is not the product itself, but it is the value that they receive from it. So if you're familiar with Mario, you may recognize this, if you're not, I'm sorry. Uh, but really what this tries to communicate is that even though your product may be this flower that's in the middle of this image here, when we're trying to win customers or market our product, are we really listing the attributes of the flower? It's green, it has yellow petals, or are we describing how awesome our customer is going to be once they receive our product. What we're selling to our customers is not the product itself, but it is the value that they receive. If we think back to our water example, if we think about just describing and communicating what the product itself is, that's not very compelling. This is a, couple of, a cup of water. It is clear, it is tasteless. If we want to win customers, convince them that they should use this product, we need to describe the value, not the product itself. And I see this all the time in product updates or product descriptions. It ends up looking like a list of features that the product incorporates. We need to get better at communicating value and there's a simple, way to do that. We can use a value proposition structure to help us always think back to what it is that we want to communicate to our customer. The first one is our logic. What is that fireball or what is that value that we're really trying to sell? What is the value that the customer receives? Our logic is 
the connection between our product and what it does for the customer. As I mentioned earlier as well, we always want to look at value in comparison to something else. So it's important for us when we're articulating value to our customers that we also highlight the alternatives. If you don't buy this or if you don't use the service, what is the alternative? If you don't buy this gym membership, you're impacting your health. If you don't buy now, you're losing out on $20. If you don't have this, you'll never fit in at school. I, maybe that's too far. We want to be ethical in the way that we are uh, articulating value in our products. But it's important to be able to compare them to something. And finally, it's also super, super important that when we're talking about our products, that we are consistent in how we do so. Having a really complex message of value makes it harder for different people to understand and different teams to be able to utilize. So when we're thinking about describing the value of the product, it's really important to remember to keep it simple so that we can keep it consistent. If we have a consistent message that we tell our customers, it's going to be easier for them to remember and associate with the value that they want when the context comes up that they want to use that, receive that value in. So if we apply this idea to our cup of water, and I'm not a, a marketing or branding expert, but we can think about something a little bit more compelling than this is a cup of water, it is clear. Instead, we can say, the value is that you're going to end up hydrated and energized. You're your best when you're hydrated and energized. Don't put up with being thirsty and tired. The alternative if you don't drink this water. And then we just make sure that we use that message, that articulation of value consistently. You're not your best when you don't have water. You are your best when you're hydrated and energized. Don't put up with being tired and thirsty. It's very clear now what is the value that people get from water and what is the alternative if they don't take it. So this is just a simple way for us to think about articulating value in a really clear way focused on the benefits that the customer receives. So finally, once we've got to the point that we're able to communicate the value to our customer, we then need to go back and measure it. Because of course, if you cannot measure it, you cannot improve it. So most of us are familiar with this concept of build, measure, learn. And measure is a really key step of this process. We need to measure the impact that we're making to our customers to be able to validate that we're actually moving in the right direction. And of course, we wanna use that information to help us make better decisions in the future, whether they're around our product or our business strategy. So how do we start with measurement? How do we get started and actually start building up this ability to measure? We start first by understanding metrics. If you think about metrics, if you think about your body as a product, things like your BMI, your body temperature, your heart rate, your blood rate, how many calories you eat, your weight itself, these things are all metrics about the health of your body. If any of those metrics appear out of ordinary, you would probably do some analysis to figure out why. Maybe go get a blood test or a CT scan, or maybe you just use those metrics to set yourself goals or targets to achieve. Like I want to reduce my BMI, so I'm going to go to the gym. These are metrics that you can track to understand the health of your body. In product management, we actually want to do something very similar. 
we want to be able to track and measure the health of our product and the value that we are delivering to our customers. Why? So that we can measure them, so that we can improve them. Because if we don't measure them, then we're not going to know whether or not we're moving in the right direction because we won't be able to track or improve. So when we're talking about metrics, metrics have a few key properties that we need to consider. And this is some kind of best practice for the metrics that you're thinking about. They should be quantifiable, they should be measurable. That's what a metric is. It's something that you can measure. It's something quantifiable that you can actually understand and put a number to. They should be performance or goal driven. Metrics should help you understand how or why this thing helps customers achieve a goal. And they should be specific, they should be clear enough to know exactly what you are talking about when you are talking about that metric. And finally, they should be time-based. A metric should be relative to time. And when I say time-based, I don't mean like a SMART goal, which is another framework you may be familiar with. Time-based here talks about they should be relative to a point in time, i.e. my weight last week on Wednesday at 5 p.m. was this. So metrics must be associated with a point in time so that you're able to identify what a metric was then and what it is now or what it might be in the future. That is where you're actually able to start understanding the difference in direction that your product health is moving in and whether or not it's moving in the right direction. Is it going up or down over time? So if we put that into a sentence, in the broadest terms, a metric is any collectible, quantifiable measure that enables one to track the performance of an aspect of your product or business over time. Now, there are many different types of metrics, and they can fall into one of any of these categories, whether it is a business metric, a product usage metric, a quality metric, or some sort of product development metric. All of these can be valuable. Business metrics might tell you how much revenue you're making. Product usage metrics might tell you how people are using the product, which pages are they going to, which buttons are they clicking on the most? While product quality might tell you what is the overall quality of your product in terms of bugs reported, crashes logged, or even customer support tickets raised. Product development metrics can be useful for understanding how fast your team is moving in terms of velocity or cycle time. But customer value metrics are really, really important because it helps us understand what is the value our customers are getting. Are they able to complete their goals? Are they able to avoid whatever threat that it is that they're trying to, or are they able to receive that reward that they're looking for? And although there are many different types of metrics and they can all be valuable in different circumstances and contexts. Just because you can track them doesn't mean that you should. Some data for you is going to be more valuable than others because it gives you some unique insight into your product's health. As an example, you may have seen this image before from businessillustrator.com. There is a huge difference between tracking and measuring the number of arrows fired versus hitting a bullseye. So what is the metric that is going to be more important for you to track and look at? Probably the one on the right. So how do we actually get started with measuring success? How do we start to identify the value in our products? We always want to take it back to our customers. 
we need to understand that value and success is related to helping our customers achieve their goals. So whether that means uh, helping them feel more connected or whether that means helping them avoid a cold day with a scarf, our customers all have goals and our products and features that we're building are delivering some value to them. So if you want to start measuring success, how do you get started? We can get started with measuring success and understanding and measuring value by playing a game. Now, game is another model or framework I would like to share with you to help you think about structuring and measuring value in your products. When we game our metrics, we always start by focusing on our customer value, not delivering features. Our goals should be customer oriented. And when we go back to the problem space, we wanna think about what exactly it is that our product solves for our customers. What is the problem it solves or what is the value it provides? If we understand that, then we can better understand what is the goal of the customer. And when thinking about metrics, we always wanna start with that goal. What are we helping our customers achieve? Are we trying to help them complete a task in a shorter amount of time? Are we trying to help a customer discover new ways of working? Are we just trying to help them buy something quickly online and easily that they want? We always start with a goal. Once we know what that goal is, we want to think about the actions or the user flows that help that customer achieve that goal. What are the different user journeys that they might take to reach that goal? What are the key steps within that journey? And then within those steps, what are the unique actions that they actually take? What pages in your product are they going to look at? What fields are they going to fill out? What buttons are they going to click? How detailed you get with that can depend. I generally suggest starting more high level in terms of understanding what the actions are that they take. And then as you get more familiar with the metrics that you're tracking, you can start to dig into more detail. Once you discover that there might be a specific point in that journey that you want to find out more information about. So why is this really important? Because we want to know how our customers are using our products and when or where they potentially stop using it. We want to understand what's easy for them and what's difficult. How long does everything take? If we understand that, we can better understand the journey and we can better understand what it takes for our users to achieve their goals and then start trying to make it faster, trying to make it better or easier to use. Once we understand what those key actions are, we go on to actually implementing the measurements. After defining those different actions, which usually comes in the form of some sort of uh, data taxonomy, we want to figure out what we're actually going to track about those actions. And as a base structure, we always want to think about at least, from my perspective, the minimum of tracking the breadth, depth, frequency, and efficiency. That covers how many customers are taking the, a certain action. It covers the amount of times that they take that action. And it covers how often they do it and how long it takes them to complete. Once we have that, that pretty much allows us to be able to answer any sort of question that we want about a particular action or customer journey. And note that you don't have to do everything at once. It kind of takes time to build up and you may start with just a small part of the measurement of the journey. The final part of this is the evaluation. After we've done all of this, 
How do we analyze it? How do we bring those measurements that we have into our strategic thinking, into our government governance meetings, and into our sprint reviews and retrospectives to figure out what is going well? What are the different reports that we need to create to show that we're on track to achieving our goals and that we're actually delivering value to our customers? There's plenty of different ways to do that, uh, whether it's in daily or weekly meetings or some sort of quarterly governance meetings. But regardless, you should be focusing on incorporating this evaluation step into your project. There are some additional notes that I think you also need to consider when you're thinking about uh, applying this game framework, such as what is the implementation plan? Are you going to tag everything at once? What tools do you need to use? When do we do this at the beginning of our project or as we build? What does our metric taxonomy look like? What are the different guardrails? What tools? How often should we review them? These are all questions that I would encourage you to consider as well. But unfortunately, within today's session, I don't think I have enough time to go into them. But I wanted to highlight that as well. And then finally, just to kind of summarize everything that I've gone through today, product managers should be good at four things, OK? Understanding value, building value, communicating value, and measuring it. To help us think about understanding value, we can use the SCARF model to understand what motivates our customers to use products or features. To communicate value, we can use that idea of value logic, comparison, and consistency to write really clear value statements. And finally, to measure value delivered, we can use the game framework to help us get started with implementing and evaluating metrics in our products. Thank you very much. Uh, that's the end of my talk for today. I'd be happy to take any questions at this point. And if there are no questions, then we can wrap up. If you do want to reach out to me, if you have any questions, feel free to email me. My email address is there, or you can connect with me on LinkedIn, just search Edward Hutchins, you will find me there. Uh, thank you all so much for having me today and I hope this session was valuable for you.